episode of self-directed i don't want to be that cheesy podcast guest that always says we have a very special guest but i am actually very excited today because somebody i'm a huge fan of whose content i've been following for a long time Corey DeAngelis, director of school choice for the reason foundation adjunct scholar at cato institute and the executive director at educational freedom institute you can follow him at DeAngelis Corey on twitter and so much more Corey, welcome to self-directed hey thank you so much for having me yeah, excited. So I just want to dive right in. And, and the biggest burning question I have is like, what's your backstory? Where did your fire for schools, for school choice, education, where did it all begin? Like, you know, as, er, as <laughs> well, far back as you need to go. Well, the fire comes from the, 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 the fact that I know I'm right with all these arguments. Yeah. There aren't any really any good arguments against school choice. There's no reason why we should force people to attend residentially assigned government run schools uh, and if we're going to fund education, uh, we should make it similar to food stamps where the money follows the individual and not the system. There's no reason why the money should go directly to a residentially assigned government run school. Similarly, there's no reason why food stamps should go directly to a residentially assigned government run grocery store. Families are able to take those dollars to a grocery store of choice, and it could be a private grocery store. You don't just have to go to one specific store, uh, and you, you can essentially vote with your feet in that. Uh, market, just like any other government funded program, essentially Pell Grants, Section 8, housing vouchers, uh, pre-K programs are essentially vouchers for, uh, you know, uh, before K through 12 education. So it's only in K through 12 education that it's any different. Um, so the, the arguments are just completely ridiculous uh, that are lobbed against, you know, allowing people to have the freedom to choose their own schools. But then my particular desire and, you know, how I got into the whole movement uh, there's a couple of stories there. One is that I went to government-run schools all throughout my K-12 education, yep. and I saw how crummy it could be, uh, particularly in middle school. Um, you know, I, there was a lot of gang activity and fighting and drugs and bullying going on. I was actually, you know, picked on for not walking with a limp because I walked to, you know, straight up. And so there's like a lot of these negative forms of socialization going on in the school system that I think, you know, um, voting with your feet could help uh, with, with academically and socially. Um, but I, I actually got the chance to go to a magnet high school. And so a magnet school yeah. is a school of choice. And I define a school of choice. It's a school that you are not residentially assigned to. So you voluntarily opt into that school and the money follows the person to that school. So just for the listeners real quick, I define school choice as anything that gets you away from that residentially assigned monopoly school system. In the US overall, mostly you live in a per particular place and you're residentially assigned to a particular government run school. If you want to do anything else, you're pretty much out of luck um, because it's highly costly to pay for a private school out of pocket. And if you want to go to another district school, you either got to go through the court system or uh, you, know, you, know, you got to make an argument to the other district to take you and to, you gotta argue to your district to allow you to leave. So it's really hard to transition schools. But with magnet schools, it's still a government run school and it just breaks up. It doesn't have that residentially assigned uh, issue. And so I was able to opt in. What was really interesting about that particular school I went to in San Antonio, Texas, I had four different magnet schools I could pick, but all the magnet yeah. schools were located on or near the campus of the school that you were residentially assigned to. So I was residentially assigned to one government run school and I played sports for that school, which was a great benefit. But I was able to see firsthand the difference in the magnet school and the residentially assigned school as far as educational outcomes. And then also this, these socialization factors that I mentioned earlier, you know, you walk through the halls of the residentially assigned school it's supposed to go to, you look into the classrooms, doesn't look like there's a lot of learning going on, a lot of disruption in the classroom, uh, a lot of, you know, um, gang activities were more likely at that campus and fighting, you'd see fights in the hallways um, and all of these other issues. So I think everybody should have a choice like that. Everybody should be able to opt out of their residentially assigned school. One way to do that is a magnet school program but another way could be a, a charter school, which is mm -hmm. a non-government run public school of choice. It gets kind of complicated, but it's just <laughs> another option, right? And then, you, yeah. you know, private schools as well. Why shouldn't the money follow you to a privately run school as well? Why should only rich people be able to, uh, you know, send their kids to private schools? We're already spending the money in the education system. We spend over $15,000 per child per year in the U.S. 
why not allow that money to follow the child to the best school for them, whether it's run by the government, whether it's a private school, whether it's a charter school, home education options. You should be able to take that $15,000 or some yeah. some fraction of that $15,000 and take it to help offset home education expenses. And, you know, as you know, a lot of families are seeing right now the benefits of home education, you know, either avoiding those negative forms of socialization or, you know, just learning better or, you know, just having kids more interested in what they're doing. Um, you know, some of that money should follow children into the household as well. Um, so yeah, that's the main idea here. That's how I got into it. I also did my training in my bachelor's and master's as an economist. So looking at the school system as an economist, you know, alarm bells go off in your head because you see the monopoly power yep. that's created by a couple of things. One, compulsory education laws. You have to consume the product. Uh, residential assignment. That's the biggest issue, I think, that in order to go to a different place, you have to move houses, essentially. If yeah. you want to go to a different school, you got to move houses. Just imagine if you wanted to change restaurants from week to week, and in order to do so, you had to get up and, and pack up and buy another house. And, and particularly, if you wanted to get a better restaurant, you had to buy a really expensive house. That wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> um, that's a huge transaction cost, and, and any economist should look at this and say, this is a problem. You know, The money to yeah. follow the child, people should be able to pick. Uh, you know, their educational services. And if they're able to do that, you should see more competitive pressures and better outcomes. And that's what we see with the school choice evidence too. Yeah. It almost sounds like just gerrymandering education lines. Like, you know, we're going to, we're going to draw a line and, and get the best teachers over at this school where there's higher income people. And, and, you know, like there, there are so many negative things. What are, what are some of the direct consequences that you see, you know, negative implications in, in particular of like residential assignment? Education. Oh, there's ton, there's tons of it. Obviously, there's no incentive to do a good job with residential assignment. That's the main thing, right? If if you know your customers can't leave, then you don't provide a good service. You do <laughs> yeah. you do the worst you, you can possible. And it's not that the people in the system are bad or that they're incompetent. It's just that the system is the problem. The system sets them up for failure. And you know, if you're a a kick butt teacher, you don't really get paid much more than a teacher who's not doing a good job. Uh, the the pay scale of also is just based on, you know, how long you've been in the system and whether you have a master's degree, which has no bearing on your effectiveness as a teacher. Um, but yeah, the, the residential assignment leads to those quality problems, those cost problems. We see skyrocketing costs in the education system yep. without improved outcomes over time. But then also this obviously could lead to racial segregation. You see that uh, if you look at the private school choice evidence, that when people are able to leave their racially segregated, socioeconomically segregated government run schools, then, you know, society and schools actually tend to become more integrated as a result of letting people choose whatever school and not, you know, uh, following that same system of, uh, you know, uh, segregated government schools and, you know, neighborhoods are segregated. And this is partially why this leads to school segregation in the current system. So, Allowing people to choose leads actually to yeah. more integration, um, which is not what's talked about in the mainstream media. You hear yeah. people saying the opposite about school choice, that school choice is somehow for the rich. No, it's not. So, you know, uh, <laughs> people, the, the least advantaged kids in, in, uh, in the United States today are stuck in the worst government run schools because they're, they tend to be in the lower property value areas. They tend to get less funding. They tend to get the lower quality teachers. And so by trapping them in those schools, you create huge inequities in the government-run school system, whereas school choice, look, rich people already have school choice. Rich people could already afford to live by the fancy, smancy uh, government-run schools and the higher quality government-run yeah. schools, and they can already afford to pay out of pocket, essentially paying for, for two schools, paying for the, the government-run school through the property tax system, and they can afford to pay out of pocket for a high-quality private education as well. School choice is an equalizer because it allows students who would have never, who would have not uh, been as likely to be able to afford private education, be able yeah. to afford that private education as well. So it's an equalizer, just as the same way as a Pell Grant is an equalizer. Uh, a pre-K program could be an equalizer if it has positive effects. Um, you know, food stamps could be an equalizer in society. It's only in K through 12 education where the the narrative is flipped around in, in many of the media sources, and it shouldn't be. Yeah, not everybody can afford to bribe Harvard admissions office for, you know, <laughs> their, their freshmen to get in. So um, I, I've got some more questions about, you know, what you were just talking about and, and kind of what you think is, is are, are the best versions. But before that, I, I want to be sure that 
you know, I'm clear and, and listeners are clear in like the, the definitions that you start of, like that you start from. So like, in your opinion, what's the ideal aim of education? Well, I, w- I thought you were going to ask something else. So I'm going to answer the question I thought you were going to ask yeah. first. But, you know, one of the main definitions I use is I call these government run schools. Most people, yeah. other people in society would call these traditional public schools. But government school is the most accurate term to use for a couple yeah. of reasons. The schools are directly operated and run by the government. They are funded by government sources. They are regulated by state, local, and federal governments. Uh, they are compelled by government. We have compulsory education laws compelled by the government. Um, and then also, I don't, I don't like to call them public schools because they're not public in any meaningful sense of yeah. the word. Coming from the economics background, they're not public goods because they are excludable and rivalrous in consumption, which is you know, a little bit of you know, e- economics jargon. But more importantly, public schools or government schools are not open to the public. It, you know, like a public park, if I walk by, I can access a public park, right? It's open yeah. to the public. But if I don't live in the fancy neighborhood, I don't get to send my kids to the fancy uh, government school. So look, they're operated by the government, they're run by the government, they're funded by the government, they're compelled by the government, they're regulated by the government, and they're not open to the public. So government school is the most accurate term to use. And if people, you know, get upset about me using that, they should question themselves as to why <laughs> it makes them feel weird to deal and contend with the fact that the government is running our schools. It could be because the government doesn't re- do a really good job at other things. And the fact is the government doesn't do a really good job with running schools either. Uh, but yeah. to get to yeah, your I think, actual I think anybody, question. <laughs> I was going to say, I think anybody who's been to the DMV can, can agree with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's not just here, right? I mean, in, in D.C., we spend – in the most recent school year, as far as the data we have available from 2016, 2017 school year, it's probably higher now, but we spent $28,000 per pupil per year, which is, you know, much higher than double the national, you know, about double the national average. And the outcomes are pretty abysmal in DC government schools. They, you know, they're called DC public schools, but I'm going to rename it DC GS instead of DC PS. <laughs> it's DC government schools. Yeah. Um, but your, your, you know, your main question was, what is the goal of education? And you know, uh, most people, when they evaluate school choice systems and education outcomes, they look at things like standardized test scores. And I don't think that yeah. should be the goal of education because uh, a lot of parents don't really care much about standardized test scores. Yeah. I think a lot of people are sick and tired of hearing about standardized test scores and all of the high stakes that go around testing and you know, um, the fact that testing standardized test scores often don't relate to changes in longer term outcomes. And when yep. you just ask parents who use school choice programs, you know, why did you choose this particular private school over another private school? Um, they often rank standardized testing near the bottom of the list. So for example, Jason Bedrick from EdChoice and Lindsey Burke from Heritage Foundation in 2018 surveyed over 13,000 families in Florida using a private school choice program and just asked them, what was important to you when choosing your school? And they gave them a list of like 15 different things. And at the top of the list, you know, a lot of the families ranked things like safety and cultural values and moral education at the top of the list. And, you know, one-on-one, you know, attention in the schools. And then there was, it it was either the bottom one or the second to bottom one was standardized test scores. And that was only 4% of the parents listed standardized test scores as being in one of the top three, even the top three reasons for choosing a particular school. So parents don't care about these things all that much. I think education is to live a better life, right? I mean, and there's a lot of different, that can mean different things to different people. And because it's so varied, I think that's another reason for school or educational choice to let people figure out what they want from life and and from the education system. And, you know, that's just another argument, again, for allowing people to pursue uh, their educational interests and desires. And so, yeah, it's living a better life. And there's a lot of ways to look at that. It could be higher income. I mean, if you ask people what education means to them and and what it means to have a successful education, they may say things like, oh, you know, I want to get higher standardized test scores, but it's not because the Standardized yeah. test score is that's, the end. That's an they indicator. Think, yeah. Yeah. They think that's some way, you know, if I get the higher standardized test scores, well, then I'm going to get to a higher income later in life. They, they think that, you know, doing this will get me into college, going to college will make me rich for whatever reason when it actually doesn't. It's just a yeah. signaling device that yeah. doesn't work very well in the long run anyway. And, you know, a lot of the times I would argue that, 
you know, it's, it's, it would be, there's there are much, there are much more efficient ways to gain skill, real skills and job market skills. And, and there are other ways to signal to employers, such as like creating a portfolio. Um, you know, and that's how I do it with, with my job. If I just brought my piece of paper from, you know, my PhD <laughs> yeah. and I hadn't produced anything, my employer would be like, okay, who cares? You, 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 you jump through hoops for, you know, 10 extra years longer than you needed to. Um, but that doesn't tell me you can actually produce anything. So yeah. I think even people do, that do have the signal of, of, uh, that piece of paper, they need to supplement that with other things that are more meaningful, such as, you know, either peer reviewed journal articles or op-eds or depends on your field, obviously, but you can yeah. construct different portfolios based on where, where you're going. It's, it's encouraging to hear you say that because I think many people do get caught up on that. You know, same thing with test scores as they get on later in life and they're, they're making mm -hmm. a decision about, should I go to college or I graduated from college? Should I go get a master? Should I go pursue higher education? Is, is getting caught up on, on the credential as a sufficient device to get the life that they want. It's like, I have to go get more school because that's what unlocks yeah. all the things in life. And it's like, actually, like, it turns a, a out it's not true. It's not true. <laughs> why, a lot did of employers, I, why did yeah. I waste, yeah. why did I waste so just, much time? <laughs> yeah, a lot of employers just want to know, hey, are you willing to show up? Can you do the job? Like, you yeah. know, I, I don't care if you went to Berkeley or, you know, Brown or whatever. Like, are you still going to show up and do the job? Yeah, it's great that you could decorate your wall with that thing. But like, also, you know, like, like, can you well, do the job? Well, another thing that's interesting about the standardized test score stuff, the evidence on standardized, you know, school choice and outcomes is positive for standardized test scores. If you look at the most rigorous evidence, but it's not like overwhelmingly positive, like the yeah. other outcomes. When you look at things like crime, the effects tend to be, you know, reducing crime tend to be a lot larger for school choice or just like tolerance of other people's viewpoints, um, civic outcomes, other types of civic outcomes and democratic outcomes and satisfaction outcomes tend to be a lot more positive. Uh, yeah. for school choice than standardized testing outcomes. And I think part of it is because, look, parents don't give much of a hoot about standardized test scores. They care about more about the long-term outcomes yeah. and happiness of their children and whether they're actually satisfied with the particular school. Yeah. They care about whether the school is safe. Um, you know, test scores aren't going to do you really good if you're, if you're not, you know, in a safe situation, for example. Um, and so th I think that's part of it. But what's also interesting is a lot of the deniers of school choice, I like to call them, or the defenders of the status quo government school system. For example, Diane Rabbit, she's, she's notorious for this. She argues constantly against standardized test scores, but then in the same essay, she'll turn around and say, charters are a failure, or you know, private school choice programs are a failure. Then she'll point to one negative study and cherry pick instead of pointing, you know, looking at the preponderance of the evidence. She'll say, oh, look, in Louisiana, the test scores went down. Uh, but you just said early, you know, two paragraphs earlier that you didn't care about test scores and that yeah. they weren't meaningful indicators of success. So which one is it? So since it seems like they spin the story, the deniers of school choice will spin the story however, however it fits them, even within the same essay um, and, and completely contradict their earlier points about where they're right. You know, they're actually yeah. right that standardized test scores aren't yeah. all that important. Uh, but then they'll, they'll use it to try to demonize school choice, which is completely, uh, you know, pretty, pretty much beyond parity. Yeah. So, so in your opinion, what are better meaningful indicators of success, you know, in measurable ones in particular, as far as, you know, whatever you pursue for school, what, what's the best way to measure those? Yeah. Well, how do we measure whether, you know, whether, whether uh, another type of product does us any good in, in, in life? Well, we, we consume the product and we, you know, you, you ask us, you know, did you choose this product? Yeah. And well, well, did you like it? Yes or no. If you liked it and you want to continue using it, then that's success, right? That's a successful product. Um, and that can look like, again, that can look like a tons of different things depending on the particular individual. But like when I'm trying to figure out if a restaurant is any good, I don't look at their average calorie um, uh, amount on their menu. I mean, I could look at that as part of the overall picture, but that's yeah. not the only thing that I look at, right? I, I mostly look at Google reviews and Yelp reviews and different types of reviews from other customers. And then I'll, I go experience it myself. And if, and if I see that I don't like it and, and that doesn't mesh really well with, with that overall rating from Google or Yelp, I go somewhere else. I vote with my feet. And that's again, why residential assignment is so yeah. problematic because, you know, a, a particular school could look good on average, either by yeah. test scores or, or even on satisfaction, but it might not work for my kid. Maybe they don't like whatever that school specialized in. Maybe they want something else. And so that's pretty much my vague answer for education, that it's, it has a lot to do with the individual needs 
and desires. Yep. And yeah, I mean, the way I would look at it is, you know, uh, customer reviews, but then individual experiences about satisfaction and, and, and what people perceive. But if, if we were going to use some type of quantitative metric, it wouldn't be standardized test scores. I mean, it would be something longer term. I mean, um, you could look at high school graduation rates. And, and you know, uh, the diploma isn't the only thing that's important, but it, it, it could lead to better longer term outcomes, like yeah. the, the happiness that we were talking about earlier. But then, I mean, obviously, we want to look at things like um, effects on earnings as well. But the problem is we don't have a lot of evidence on s- school level effects on earnings, yeah. right? So, yeah. um, again, it really needs to come down to that individual perception uh, by yeah. individual families, which can differ vastly between different families within the same exact school, just because yeah. students are so unique and different. Well, it's also difficult to answer that, you know, that, that ever popular economist question compared to what, like, was this school successful compared to what, if, if it's all, all compulsory where you don't even have a choice, you know, I don't know if this successful is, you know, this education was successful or not because I couldn't, I didn't even have a choice to go anywhere else. You know, yep. they're going to come arrest my kids if, you know, for truancy, if I put them, took them somewhere else. So, well, yeah, I mean, you see the attacks on homeschooling that were lobbied from uh, the you know, Harvard Magazine just a few weeks ago, uh, highlighting the work of Elizabeth Bartlett, who's a Harvard Law School professor. And her whole argument was she didn't, she didn't look at compared to what. She, she said, you know, there might be some homeschooling families who don't do really well on educational outcomes. Well, like you said, well, compared to what? She didn't really take that next step yeah. and say, well, the government schools have, you know, just came out with their nation's report card just, you know, a week or two ago, finding that only 15% of kids are proficient in U.S. history. Um, well, I mean, the better way to look at, if, if you're going to make that argument about standardized test results, you, you should co- at least compare it between sectors yeah. and, and really look at, well, what if that same kid transitioned to, to the nearby government school? Does that mean they're going to do any better educationally or, or maybe they'll even do worse? Um, so that's often what's used. And I, I mentioned Diane Ravitch earlier, and she's been a big, uh, you know, um, school choice denier for a long time. And, you know, in that essay where she attacks standardized test scores and then turns around and, and uses them to demonize school choice, you know, she does this whole exception to prove the rule thing with charter schools too, where she says, well, if you look at the list of, you know, um, the failing schools in X state, Michigan or whatever, or whatever state she was looking at, she, she'll say, well, well, some of them were charter schools. Okay. Well, some of them were government run schools too. And I mean, that's the, the point of choice isn't that every single charter school option or every single private school option is going to be perfectly better than all the government schools. The point is that people should be able to sort and that the market should be able yep. to close the failing charter schools. That's a feature of the market. If there's a failing charter school, that's, that does, that's not an indictment of the entire system writ large, especially when the evidence suggests that the charter schools tend to perform better on these metrics overall in, 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 in the larger sense. Um, but look, I mean, the whole point of the market is for be able to, people to be able to sort between different types of schools. And, you know, that should lead to, uh, you know, either the lower performing schools to shape up or shut down. And yeah. that's, that's the whole point. It's not that charter schools are better all the time, always than every single, it's, you know, that's it's just an unfair comparison that that's made by the other side. Yeah. Well, it just makes, it, it doesn't make sense to me either. The, the argument to, to measure a school's success or, or failure based on test scores anyway, because like, I don't think I've ever met a kid that's, that's excited about standardized tests. Like you're, you're measuring a school's performance and their funding based on a performance metric that the people who supply that performance vector, they have no incentive. They don't like those things. Like I, I remember all the standardized <laughs> test days in, in school when I was growing up. It's like, I know that we're going to get extra long recess this day and snacks, at, you know, when we're done. That's the only incentive of, yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's just build bu- this bubble out. in the right column, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, the kids really don't have a strong incentive to do a good job, right? I mean, it's like the opposite incentive. You want to get through it. You want to get done. Um but then, I mean, the, the, the issues are even deeper than that. We, we touched on the issue of standardized tests aren't really good proxies for long-term outcomes. I mean, there's yeah. a whole literature review that was presented at Harvard um, by you know, Patrick Wolf, one of my previous advisors, just a few years ago, where he found, he looked at all the school choice evidence that looked at effects of charter schools or private school choice programs. And if that study also followed those same kids over time for longer-term outcomes, like you know, high school graduation or college graduation, he looked at the, if the effects of the schools on their test scores predicted the effects on the long-term outcomes. But about 50% of the times, 
he found that the effects did not pr successfully predict the longer term outcomes, which means that standardized test scores are not good proxies for the yeah. long, longer term outcomes that we think uh, tend to be more important. But again, the issue is even further than that. Even if we thought that standardized test scores were somehow perfect proxies for what we actually care about, I don't buy that that's the case, but let's just give that to them. You know, let's just say yeah, that that's legitimate for, for whatever reason, just for the sake of argument. Even if we thought standardized test scores are perfect proxies for success, the regulators' tools do not allow them to to differ different schools based on their student population. So you could think that a particular school is doing a bad job based on average test scores just because they're serving a disadvantaged population. So it could be that that school is actually doing a really good job at shaping those standardized test scores, yep. but the averages will make, make it look like, oh, that's a bad school. You know, so, um, and, and the, you know, some, some researchers try to control for some things, right? They'll try to control for like, how many students are using the national lunch program, which is like kind of a proxy for income, but that's not a perfect measure either. You can have two schools that have the same percentage of those, you know, uh, free and reduced lunch students, but there's a lot of variation. You can have a 20% free and reduced lunch population, a 20% free and reduced lunch population, but you can even have two free and reduced lunch students. One could be in extreme poverty and one could be right near the cutoff of free and reduced lunch or not. You never know. And so you could still penalize uh, schools just for, uh, even if they're doing it right, even if the researchers are trying to do a good job, you can still penalize the schools uh, just because they're serving disadvantaged populations. But uh, again, I think the bigger issue is that parents don't care all that much about test scores. They're not good proxies for true yeah. success. And I think the left and the right both agree on this and libertarians agree on this, that standardized testing isn't all that important. I think most, you know, uh, put, you know people from different political backgrounds, one of the few things that we can uh, agree on, again, Diane Rabich is against school choice, but we, we both agree on the fact that standardized test scores aren't great proxies for success. But then also like the regulators should think about if there's a school with a low average standardized test score and at the same time, it's not being closed by the market. Let's say it's a charter school. Let's say everybody's, there's still a wait list to get in. The regulators should really think hard about why are people choosing this school and they should really contend with the, the, the reality that, well, maybe these parents with their feet on the ground have more local knowledge about yep. what's actually going on. Maybe the school's a lot safer. Maybe they're trying to get their kids away from gang activity, which tends to lead to better longer term success that's not captured in the test score. So yep. the regulators like to use test score because it makes them feel like they have some type of information uh, that, that they can use to control the choices of others in society um, but you know, even low income families and, and families who don't have a lot of education themselves have much more information and incentives to get these decisions right and to make the right choices for their kids. Uh, these, these families have way more information incentive than some bureaucrats sitting in an office, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And I think yeah. regulators and people who oppose individual decisions about education, um, need to really look into the, that possibility. And I, I, would, I, would, I would argue it's a fact that, <laughs> that families have this information and, and incentive to do a good job. Yeah, they're mu much better incentive. So from your experience and research, what, what systems do you think offer the best education outcomes? Yeah, well, I think school choice is the best mechanism there. I've started to use the term education choice uh, yeah. because that would include homeschooling as well. You know, schooling yeah. is not the only way to achieve an education, but you know, within the system of structured schooling that we have today, being able to pick your school is better than, you know, being residentially assigned to a school. And, yeah. and I would say it's even better to be able to include in that choice set some type of homeschooling or micro schooling option yeah. or some type of unschooling option as well. And the, the money should follow the child wherever they're receiving an education, whether it's in a school or not. Um, but look, the, the evidence on school choice mechanisms tends to be positive, like I said earlier, based on especially for things like satisfaction, yeah. um, educational attainment outcomes, such as in, you know, enrolling in college, graduating from college, graduating from high school, which again, aren't perfect proxies for success, but based on the data we have, tends to be more positive for these things. Also things like civic outcomes. Um, but look, again, I don't think, you know, the, I don't think 
there is one best system. I mean, maybe a particular charter school is best for a particular family in a particular area. And maybe that's better than all the private schools in in the area. Maybe this private school over here is better than the charter school over here. Maybe, maybe, you know, the private school setting is best for a particular family for whatever reason, whatever their schedules, um, perhaps, maybe their schedules are in conflict with the homeschool setup. Maybe homeschooling is best for a particular family. So I think, again, there's no one best way to do education. There's no one best way for every single family because everybody's unique. Everybody has their own situations. It's an argument for choice, right? I mean, that's why we need choice. We need people to be able to sort into their own uh, particular school type. Um, But just from a, a theory perspective, I would think that, private options are better than charter options, which would be better than government options as well. Um, I would think that private schools or private forms of education with low amounts of regulation should, uh, in theory, be the best form of education uh, overall, just because, you know, they, they, they have more freedom and autonomy to, to uh, you know, control their discipline policies, their educational policies, and they can move, you know, um, they can they can adapt to changes much quicker with you know without all the heavy hand of government regulation. So that's why I think that private options could be the best. And then also as an economist, they can set their prices, right? They can yeah. change their tuition levels. Charter schools are great and it's a great option, but they can't increase or decrease tuition levels. They have to be a quote unquote free like the government schools. That's yeah. partially why charter schools are also uh, called public schools still is because they cannot charge a tuition and they also can't be religious. Yeah. And that's another thing that could be a benefit for private education for some families. You, you, you also have the freedom to have a religious education, yeah. which I'm not a religious person myself. Uh, I never really have been, but I understand that, you know, there could be benefits of religious education yeah. with, with moral education and giving someone a moral compass. I understand that. And I think adding that to the choice set is a good thing. And that's another reason why uh, I've actually you know, made some arguments against charter schools before because they, they could crowd out this, this, this superior form of choice, this more free uh, yeah. form of educational freedom, which is you know, a yeah. purely private uh, form. And <laughs> no, I think and education savings leave. accounts are the best type of oh, school yeah. choice. Yeah, I, heard, I, was, I was listening to you talk a little bit more about that. Explain, explain those for listeners too. I think that's a really yeah. cool concept. Yeah, so, um, you know, we have public, we have, the, you know, lots of different types of school choice. And as I've said before, uh, the way I define education choice or school choice is allowing people to opt out of the residentially assigned option and to take some of their education dollars, or all, I think they should be able to take all of their education dollars. If we're spending $15,000 per kid, that money should follow the child wherever they're receiving an education. So that could be in the government school, private school, yeah. home, home option. And so with the voucher, this was the idea put forth by Milton Friedman, and it was, it's actually been around longer than Milton Friedman. We've had voucher programs in the U.S. in a couple of states called town tuitioning programs in Maine and Vermont. Uh, even before Milton Friedman was born, a lot of people don't know that. So I like to mention that every once in a while. It, these programs have been around since the you know mid to late 1800s in those two states before Milton Friedman was even born. But the idea behind the voucher program that was really highlighted by Milton Friedman in 1955, his 1955 essay, The Role of Government in Education, was that you opt out of your residentially assigned school for whatever reason, if it's not working for you, uh, and you get to take some of the money that would have followed your child to that school in the form of a voucher to be able to pay for a private school tuition uh, using that same education dollars. It's kind of like a food stamp, right? If I don't like spending my food stamp at Walmart, I don't have to spend it at Walmart. I can take it somewhere else in the form of a food stamp or voucher and spend it, you know, at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or Harris Teeter, or whatever type of grocery store I want, it could be a privately run grocery store. That's the same idea behind Pell Grants too. The Pell Grant doesn't go to some residentially assigned community college and you know, you're not forced to go to the nearest community college to use your Pell Grants. You can take that Pell Grant to a publicly or privately run university of choice. So the voucher idea is like that at the K-12 level too. It's kind of like a Pell Grant um, or a food stamp for K-12 education. The problem with the voucher in most forms, at least, is that you can only use it for private school tuition and fees. You can only use this for one particular type of education, which is a private school option. And you can also, you can also use it and stay in your government run school, obviously, but that you you never get the voucher at that point. Just kind of stays, just (laughs) kind of stays with the government school. And so that's still an option, but with an education savings account, it's the same kind of thing. 
you get that money from the school that you would have went to when you opt out for, again, whatever reason, maybe they're not, it's not a safe environment, maybe they're not, you know, maybe the teacher's being mean to your student or picking on, you know, maybe there's bullying going on, maybe the academic outcomes aren't great, but for whatever reason, you opt out, and instead of having that money come in the form of a voucher, it goes into an education savings account for the individual child. The benefit there is that you could use it all for private school tuition and fees, same way, yep. right? Or you could use it for other educational expenditures, such as tutoring, private tutoring, textbooks, online curriculum. Uh, you can roll the funds over from year to year, which gives people an incentive to spend the money wisely. With a voucher, if I have an $8,000 voucher and I spend it uh, for a tuition of 6000 I don't get to keep the $2,000 yeah. differential, which as an economist essentially creates a price floor in the market for education. So there's no incentive to economize. With an education savings account, if I get that $8,000, I can use $6,000 to for the private school tuition, and then I can use the other $2,000 for you know some extra tutoring on the side or another calculator that my student needs. Maybe they need a, some type of instructional online material that they want to access, even though a lot of that material is already free. Uh, but let's say I, I, I still had $1,000 left over from the $8,000. I can roll it over to the next year. Yeah. And so that builds in an incentive to economize on, you know, on schooling. Uh, but then it also gives you an incentive to, and you could use, the, in some programs, you can use that rolled over funding for higher education as well. If you don't use it for higher education, that money goes back to the state education budget. So that's yeah. the basic benefits of education uh, savings accounts. It, it, it moves us from school choice to education choice, and yeah. it allows parents to customize their children's education much more than a particular voucher. And yeah. I will say, at, since we're on this topic, with vouchers, you know, you opt out of the, the private school, the, or the, the, the government-run school that you were supposed to go to or that you were residentially assigned to, and you could take some of that money from the state education budget. That's a publicly funded form of of school choice. There's also privately funded forms of school choice. There's something called tax credit scholarships. So, yeah. instead, you know, when you moved out of your residentially assigned school, another way to set this, these types of programs up is to incentivize taxpayers for whatever, you know, with tax credits to, to donate to a scholarship granting organization, a private organization. You know, um, if you donate whatever, you know, dollars to, to this organization for corporations, households, and individuals, they get to, you know, get a little bit of a tax kickback for yeah. that. And so they have incentives to donate. And then, but the thing, the important part of here is that that money stays private. It never comes into the tax collector's hands. And as the U.S. Supreme Court and state Supreme Courts have ruled consistently in the United States, private money remains private. And the quote is, until the money enters the tax collector's hands. And yeah. so since it's privately funded, you never, you don't get the, you don't run into these arguments where people say things like, Oh, you're, you're using public funds to fund, to fund private institutions. Well, no, the money's still private. And I mean, the main argument about the public funding thing is that, Oh, well we need to regulate it because people are spending my tax money is the argument. Yeah. Well, with privately funded programs, we see that these are tend to be less regulated. And I think it's partially because they're not, uh, labeled as public dollars. All yeah. dollars are private to begin yeah. with, but you know they they get that public label once it's taken from us or extorted from us. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean that's the main difference. And then ESAs can be, and so yeah, when you you have that pot of money, the private money in the scholarship granting organization, the only difference is when you when you want to leave your residentially assigned school, you go to the scholarship granting organization, and they give out the scholarships to the students, the money never comes into the tax collector's hands, yep. it's still private, less regulated. And you can do that with ESAs too, where you, instead of coming to the scholarship granting organization and getting a voucher, you can get the ESA funding. Yeah. So, the, awesome. the, I mean, I feel like I'm overcomplicating things a bit, no, but again, I mean, it's just having the money follow the child. There's just different ways of doing it and structuring it. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, Pretty interesting, but the main idea is allowing people to get get away from that residentially assigned government monopoly system and allowing the money to follow the child. Well, yeah, and to have have a choice about you know what what they do, how you know how they educate their children, or or what they do. Um, so for parents out there who who are in these these districts or areas that you know compulsory education is the name of the game, what what advice or resources, you know, what would you suggest to them for parents who are looking for some type of alternative or some options? but compulsory education is 
you know, kind of, kind of what, what happens where they're at. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what state that you're in, but you can look at ed choice. Um, you just go Google ed choice. They used to be called the Friedman foundation for educational choice, but now they just changed and made it simplified to ed choice. And you can look up your state and see if there's any private school choice programs in, in your area. And perhaps, you know, maybe there's a private school choice program that's available that you didn't know about. Also, 45 of the 50 states and the District of Columbia already have charter school laws in place. So you may be in a state that has yet you have access to charter schools. And then maybe you're in, you know, in Texas, we had charter schools as well, but I went to a magnet school. That's another type of option you can look into. And there might also be options for district interdistrict transfers where you can pick a different a, a school that you're not residentially assigned to. That's another option, but you just need to look into these types of options. But then also, you know, maybe maybe you don't have those options available in your state, and maybe you don't have a nearby charter school, or maybe the charter school isn't the type of education you're looking for. I would look into all of the homeschooling resources uh, yeah. at places like LearnEverywhere.org. They actually set up this group, and it it spiked in the number of people that are in this group on Facebook, Learn Everywhere. If you just Google that or put it into Facebook, you'll find a group called Learn Everywhere. And I think a lot of families came together almost spontaneously during the pandemic because we're essentially all homeschoolers yeah. now in a, in a sense, not in the strict sense of the word, but we're essentially being forced to educate our kids from home. Um, and that's not the, a perfect form of homeschooling, but a lot of families, you know, needed help. So they went to this group and I think there's like over 13,000 uh, families that have been sharing resources with one another in this particular group of how to homeschool and, you know, uh, how to approach homeschooling and free online resources such as Khan Academy. They've been sharing those types yep. of resources. There's things like TED education, like the TED Talks, but there's a YouTube channel where they have lots of educational materials there as well. So we have a lot of educational materials available to us for free, essentially, online if you have access to the internet. And I think there's a lot more information than people realize, uh, and which makes homeschooling much easier than ever before. So I would, I would tell parents to go to that Learn Everywhere group, um, but then also look into things like Khan Academy for free online educational yeah. resources as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, we have a lot of resources at our fingertips. And I, I think if people, more people start to realize that homeschooling will be a more viable option, but I think people should also start fighting for their right to have their children's education dollars if they're educating their kids at home. Yeah. Yeah. There's no reason to, I mean, right now people have the opportunity to look back and look at the education system. I mean, we're all essentially homeschoolers now and people have this opportunity to look at, well, is the factory a model of schooling really the best way that we should structure our education system today? Is it outdated at this point? Was it ever, you know, a, a legitimate form of education, even when we were in the industrial era? Um, <laughs> so I think people should question the system itself. And this, this really gives us a real opportunity to do that. And I think more people might be understanding that, look, my, my kids are less anxious, less stressed out right now because they're at home. They might be learning a lot more than they were in the schools. They might be more engaged and interested in what they're yeah. learning because it's self-directed. And they might be understanding that, you know, they can get a lot more done in a fraction of the time because they don't have to travel to school. They don't have to go from math class to English class. Uh, right when the bell tells them to do so. So there's a lot more efficiencies built into the home education model. And people might also be on, you know, realizing that, look, well, I'm educating my kids at home right now. Why in the world should the government school system get $15,000? Well, depending on where you live, but national average is over $15,000. Why should they get all that money for my child if they're not educating my child? Shouldn't I get at least like 12,000 of that? I mean, you can even let them well, yeah. keep 3,000 for, you know, for a buffer or something to make it politically and, and the feasible. Parents, and the parents who are trying to figure out, you know, now I gotta go make this extra expenditure now because my, my kids are stuck at home. Um, my taxpayers, yep. my tax dollars are already going to fund education and that's not happening. So now I've gotta go supplement it. I've gotta go invest more of my money. It would make sense. So here's a Here's a startling statistic I read for one of your one of your recent articles is, um, and I want to ask you about other shifts and trends from, from <laughs> pandemic, but 52% of parents yeah. now say they have more favorable view of homeschooling. And then this number absolutely blew my mind is that 15% of, of people polled mm -hmm. said they would homeschool kids once schools reopen. What other trends, yeah. like, are those some of the yeah. biggest ones or the other trends from pandemic that, you know, in, in terms of what's happening in the education space that you've seen going on? 
Yeah. So first I want to point out that I do think people are figuring out that the government school system shouldn't, shouldn't get education dollars for, you know, not educating their kids that if they're educating their kids at home, they should be able to take at least 12,000 or, you know, 80% of that and allow the government school to keep 20%, even though they shouldn't get to keep, you know, any of it for it. Not, you know, when I moved from Walmart to Trader Joe's with my food stamps, Walmart doesn't get to keep 20% yeah. of my funding. That's what happens with school choice programs today because they're not funded at a hundred percent, uh, you know, based on enrollment counts in our government school system. They're, they tend to be funded 20 to uh, uh, 60 to 80 percent based on enrollment so that means that the, the schools get to keep 20 to 40 percent of the uh, of the funding even after kids leave to school choice programs which doesn't make any sense I, so I have to point <laughs> that, that out because I mean one of the main arguments against school choice is that it drains funding from government schools the, the reality is that the government schools drain funding from families school yeah. choice just puts the money back into the hands of the rightful owners uh, of that those dollars but it, it gets even worse than that because when I move schools, the government school actually profits from it because they don't have to educate my kid anymore. And they get Free to money. Keep 20, yeah. 20 to 40. So imagine if Walmart got to keep 20 to 40% of my grocery bill each week or food stamps each week, even after I left the Trader Joe's or Whole Foods, that yeah. would be you, completely you ridiculous. Walmart would be thrilled. Walmart would be thrilled. Oh would be yeah, pumped. 20% I mean, extra like, margin. The problem is the government schools want to keep 100% of it. They don't want to just keep 20% of it or 40% of it. So it's all based on what they're getting right now, right? That's why there's so much pushback and why they're not celebrating the 20 to 40% because they want, they want more. But to bring up the statistics you brought up, there are you know a lot of changes of hearts, I think, going on right now in that Ed Choice is the first statistics you, you brought up. Uh, they did a nationally representative survey of parents in the United States. So, you know, we can apply these to the broader, broader population. And they found that 52% of families said that they had a more favorable view of homeschooling as a result of COVID-19, which that's surprising in and of itself because yeah, blew me away. this isn't even a good form of homeschooling. This is, you're stuck inside all day. You can't go to the museum. You it's can't compulsory the, homeschooling. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not voluntary. You just yeah. kind of, you just kind of thrown at us at random. And for people to say that this is better than, than what they imagined, it really says a lot about how the well, government schools are not really doing the a wake, really good job. Yeah, especially in the wake of that Harvard thing coming out now, it makes makes educators seem even more out of touch. That that's oh, a absolutely. The elites went to to war on homeschooling just as everybody <laughs> was doing it. That was the the name of one of my op eds in the New York Post recently. But so fifty two percent said more favorable. Only half of that amount said less favorable. So, of course, some people will say, you know, don't like yeah. this, you know, whatever. Of course, there's going to be some of that. But only 26% said they had a less favorable view. So their families overall were twice as likely to say they had a more favorable view of homeschooling as a result. And as I said before, before the statistic came out, I said, you know, you know, even if it's true that most families say, I don't like homeschooling, they weren't doing homeschooling anyway. The only people who were going to say that were the people that were already in the government yeah. schools. So I've thrown out a statistic before that in my Washington Examiner piece that even if only 2% of families said, I like homeschooling, I'm going to do that next year, that would be about a million student change because we have about 50 million students in the government school system in the most recent year of data. 2% of that's a million students. That's a lot of money. Uh, because we spend fifteen thousand dollars per pupil per year in the United States, so that's up to fifteen billion. <coughs> Sorry, math makes me cough. Uh, fifteen <laughs> billion dollars um, in in revenues potentially being directed from the government that runs schools. And looking at that compared to the homeschool population, which is under two million students today, it's about a, at least a fifty percent increase, and in, that's a huge change huge in the shift, homeschool yeah. population. And that's only if two percent want to change. Um, so, I mean, I've argued before that the reason that elites are freaking out right now and government school defenders are freaking out about, uh, you know, against homeschooling and, and launching all these unfounded attacks against homeschooling is because they know that even if they're right, that a lot of families won't like homeschooling, they essentially have nothing to gain and everything to lose. Even if 100% of families uh, say they don't like homeschooling, they don't switch. Well, you're back to the 3% of families who are homeschooling anyway. Yeah. There's no change in the, in the numbers. Yeah. Um, but it, as you also pointed out, I did a convenience poll. I mean, this, this, the ed choice one was scientific. Mine was not. So I just got to state that up front. <coughs> uh, let me get some water real quick. 
I did a, a, a poll because no, there was no date. You know, ed choice was very valuable information in that it said like people are more favorable of homeschooling, but didn't get a yeah. specific answer as to where are you going to go after this? And where did you send your kids? You before? like it now? Or are you going to just go back to normal? Yeah. yeah. So did you learn I mean, anything yeah, they, could, they yeah. could all really like it and then not switch. And then there may be no change. So, you know, uh, I didn't have the money to do a nationally representative poll, but I did one using my Twitter followers. And again, that's not scientific. I sent it out through the Reason Foundation email blast. I, I blasted it on tons of different groups on social media and elsewhere. And I got about 1,330 responses, which is actually pretty good for a social media poll like that and yeah. no monetary incentive to do so. And it was very simple. I just asked, you know, are you a parent of a K through 12 student? Yeah, you know, like 98% said yes, like 2% said no. I, I dropped those out of my sample because, well, if you're not a parent, why are you taking my poll? This is only supposed yeah. to be for parents that have kids. Uh, in the K through 12 system. And then I asked two other questions. One was, where did you send your youngest school age child right before the, cl the closure? Did, you, did they go to a traditional school, public school? They go to charter school? I didn't put government school, be, you know, not because I'm caving in, but it's because I wanted to use their language so that it didn't bias yeah. the results in any way. So I, I just wanted to make it make most sense to the, the general public. So I said traditional public school, charter, private, were you homeschooling? Were you doing a virtual school thing? And then I asked on the very next question, thinking about that same child, your youngest school age child, where are you going to send them right after the, the schools open up again after the COVID-19 lockdown? Are you going to send that kid to a traditional, same, same set of options, but I also put like a not, avail, not, not avail, available because if you think about it, they could have been in 12th grade and then, and then yeah. so I had an yeah. NA yeah. option as well yeah. um, to, to account for that. And I found some startling statistics. And again, my following and, and, and the people who took this sample could be the most likely to transition for whatever reason. Yeah. Maybe they, they just were most upset with the traditional system. Maybe that's why they're following me. Um, but 15% of, of the families who had a kid in the traditional public school system or government-run school system said that they were going to homeschool next year. And if you add up all the other types of switches – it, it, it looked like 23% of them are going to switch to something else, whether that's homeschooling, virtual school. That alone is, is just really telling that it's Huge. like whatever was going on. I, I'm not, I, I found that there's something better. So mm -hmm. I got to figure out something. 23%. Better for my kid now. And, and, and like I said, like even if only 2% went to homeschooling, that's a million. Think about 15%. That's seven and a half million. Yeah. Add that to the current homeschool population. You're essentially quintupling. Uh, the homeschool population, if that were to be the case. But again, I think that's like an upper bound, you know, that's yeah. like the, the highest of what will happen unless people start figuring out even more that homeschooling is great. Maybe they figure out that micro schooling is good. So like there's still like these, these, you know, um, myths that fly around about homeschooling, for example, like um, even now a lot of people think, well, you know, even after things, you know, even after the shutdown, I'm not going to be able to continue this because I have to go to work. But the reality is, you don't have to be the one educating your kid to, to have a homeschooling setup. Yeah. You can do things like micro schooling or hybrid homeschooling. You can send your kid to essentially a micro school, which is essentially like a homeschool setup where you have another teacher in, in a house teaching a group of five or 10 students. And so you can be at work all day and your kids should still be getting a homeschool type experience through micro schooling. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's already a big, um, you know, uh, I, I just interviewed the CEO of Prenda micro schools in oh, Arizona, yeah, for see. example. And so like, uh, he really opened my mind to that being another, uh, alternative. If you can't homeschool your kid in, in your own home and you, and if you have a, a work schedule that doesn't allow for that, send to a micro school or do a hybrid homeschool where they're home for, you know, maybe one or two, two or three days a week. But then the rest of the time they go to a brick and mortar school. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And, and, Kelly Smith, the, the CEO of Prenda Micro Schools, he had, had told me on the interview, and again, these weren't like hard statistics, but just based off the top of his head, he, he thought that his, he reported that there was a big increase in demand for his micro schools, and he estimated that to be about 20% based on the numbers he gave wow. me. He didn't say 20%. He said, you know, we had about seven, 700 before. We're, we're expecting about 850 after this. And if wow. you do the math on that, it's about 21%. Um, and that's almost in line with my, you know, that's even higher than my 15% that I yeah. got in my survey. So these numbers are matching up, you know, the yeah. EdChoice survey shows us that 
a lot of people really like homeschooling now and they like it a lot more. Uh, the anecdotes, <clears throat> the, the anecdotes are telling us that people have a lot of positive experience, at least on social media. My survey that's not nationally representative and that that's pretty unscientific to be, to admit says that about 15% might switch to homeschooling or 20, 23% might switch to any other alternative to the government run school system. And then you have CEO Kelly Smith before he even knew about this in these data points. I, I think, yeah, he, he reported that about a 21% change. Yeah. So the numbers are all you know pointing yeah. in the same direction, but again, you, yeah, we're going to have to see what actually happens. These are just, you know, opinions. To, yeah, stated preferences right now. But yeah, even, I mean, even at 20%. We need to see the like, revealed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even at 20%, like, you know, seven, seven and a half million students, 15 million parents. Um, like if that many people decide, hey, no, I actually want more choice over what we do for education. That's a massive win. Like that's a massive shift towards, you know, the, the beginnings of a massive movement where people have more control over that. Like, I don't think you well, can and, stomp, stomp down 15 million people who want exactly, something better. Well, exactly. And well, I mean, this is assuming that we're in a system without school choice, essentially. Right. So like yeah. th this 15%, just imagine if, if we actually had free choice where people could make their choice of where to send their kid and the money would follow the child. I would think that that number would be way higher because people are stating this and thinking about the current system. They're thinking, yeah. well, if I homeschool, I'm not going to get any money for doing that. But obviously if you said, well, you get a $12,000 ESA, if you do this, huh, I'm, I'll be what, what, <laughs> well, I'll be much more likely to say yes in that case. Right. Or I'll be much more likely to pay a private school or a micro school set up. And just imagine if you were a teacher at a micro school, if you could, yeah. You get $15,000 per student. You get, you know, let's just say it's 20 students. You get $300,000 if you can figure out how to make that work. Um, and another thing that was interesting about my, my uh, conversation with Kelly Smith is that they say that they, um, they, they pay their, their teachers directly about 60% of their overall funding. Whereas in the government schools, I mean, you get, you have like $15,000 per kid uh, and some change you know, 20 students per classroom or more, even if you only use 20 students per classroom, it only looks like, you know, teacher salaries on average are $60,000. Yes. 20% or far less. Yeah. Depending yeah, on where yeah, you're so, at. Yeah, yeah. Or less. So you're getting like 20% or less of the money so, yeah. allocated to you in that, in that monopoly, you know, administrative bloat infested system. Whereas yeah. when, when, when you have things like print and micro schools, you don't have to spend all that money on all the capital expenditures and things like that. You can just give it straight to the teachers. Well, yeah. And, and then, so you, I, see, then you begin to create some real incentives to get top teachers or like, you know, the absolute best teachers. Cause you know, like if you command a higher salary, obviously people are going to go, go that route. Well, and especially with like virtual education, you look at, you know, school Inc, uh, a documentary that was done by the late Andrew Coulson, who used to be the director at uh, the center for educational freedom at the Cato Institute. He was there before I was at Cato, uh, but he did a documentary and highlighted how in South Korea, they have a lot of these um, schooling setups virtually and they, you know, it's a very competitive market, a private market for students trying to get the best tutors. And there's one yeah. tutor that they highlighted getting over a million dollars a year wow. just because with the virtual platform, you can get a lot Many more than one. five or yeah. 10 students. And just think about how, you know, that competition, labor market competition can benefit teachers. A lot of people say that school choice is like a battlefield between teachers and, and families. No, we should all be on the same side of this fight because yeah. the same way competition benefits consumers, labor market competition benefits employees. School choice benefits teachers too. There's like five studies on this that find when school choice competition is introduced, the, the government run schools actually divert more resources to the classroom and to the teacher and they actually raise teacher salaries. Yeah. Um, so school choice, you know, teachers should be out striking for more school choice, not less. Well, yeah, especially for the teachers that now you start thinking about people moving online where you, you begin to remove some of the scarcity restrictions of, of one teacher and 30 students in a class. If, if a teacher is mm -hmm. now online, I can reach 100, 500, however many students, like, you know, it's maybe not as one-on-one, -on -one, but like if you, if you're really good at delivering online education, you remove that same scarcity. Now anybody can access the better teachers. Well, and, and, and when you don't have a strong incentive, this gets back to the first thing we talked about with the residential assignment. When you have monopoly power, you don't really have a strong incentive to spend the money to please your customers. That is, yeah. 
parents and, and students in this case. Well, they can't leave. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they can't they leave. leave so you don't spend as much money on the most important, you know, factor, which is the teacher, right? I mean, you don't yeah. you don't have an incentive to do so. So what do you do instead? You throw more bodies into the school. So you hire a bunch of support staff. Just a few years ago, the number of support staff uh, actually passed up the number of teachers in school. So it seems like a pretty big jobs program. But if you're spending money on support staff and you're spending money on administrative bloat, you're not spending money on teacher salaries. And we have data on this. Ben Scaffney summarized this. He's at Kennesaw State University pretty recently. And he looked at the data from 1992 to 2014 in the U.S. And he found that real per pupil expenditures gone up, have gone up by a lot, like almost 30%. But at the same time, while you know, we've poured more money into the system, average teacher salaries actually dropped by 2%. Why? Because with all the administrative bloat and just That's putting insane. more, you know, people into the system and creating more jobs, and you're not actually benefiting the individual people who are already in the system. Um, and so, I mean, that's that's obviously an issue, and it, it's because you don't have a really strong incentive to spend the money wisely. But I think it's also a, a union thing as well, because if you're a union, uh, you know, boss, you have particular incentives, and I'm not saying they're bad people. They have their, they have their incentive structure set up in a certain way. And that is to maximize union dues. How do you do that? You don't, raising teacher salaries isn't going to do that, but putting more people into the school system gives you more political power by, by more voting power uh, with more people. But then it also gives you more union dues because now you have more people paying into the system. And I think that could be part of it as well. And again, I'm not saying that they're, you know, malicious or that they're not, you know, they may actually think that, you know, doing this is, beneficial for students and at the same time beneficial for union dudes. It could be, they could be thinking both those things, but I mean, the reality is uh, teachers are getting the short end of the stick here yeah. uh, because there's a lot more money going in and they're not seeing it. And Absolutely. Uh, the evidence suggests that school choice gives the schools really good incentives to actually raise teacher salaries and to benefit teachers. And, yeah. and hey, I think it's still Teacher Appreciation Week. I think just a day or two ago. Shout out to all teacher, my teachers. Teacher Appreciation <laughs> Week. So yeah, we got to point that out. And it's a friendly reminder that school choice benefits teachers too. And if you really want to benefit teachers and you really want to appreciate teachers and show them your appreciation, you should be fighting for school choice, not against it. That's that's absolutely right. So Corey, I want to end with one big question here. You're obviously hopeful of a better future, or or I would I would imagine you're probably be doing something else. So what are you most optimistic about when it comes to the future of education? I think people are figuring out that there are no good arguments against school choice and educational freedom. Uh, when you use the analogies like food stamps and Pell grants and pre-K programs and Medicare and Medicaid and Section Eight housing vouchers and Social Security, you demolish any argument against allowing money to follow the individual family. We don't fund government grocery stores directly. We fund individual families with, with food stamps. There's no reason we should fund government schools directly. We should fund individual families with vouchers or education savings accounts. And I think this is clicking for a lot of people. And, you know, um, the main takeaway is that we should fund students instead of systems. We should fund people in, instead of monopoly systems. And I think that's clicking for a lot of people and I'm really optimistic. Um, and when I, and when you look at my Twitter feed and you look at who I'm arguing with, the arguments are never contending with logic. It's ad hominem, name calling, um, attacking people's character. It's not, there's no, there's, there are no good arguments to take away people's educational freedom. And I think a lot of people are, are understanding that. Yeah, that's awesome. Very hopeful for the future. Corey DeAngelis, everybody. It's been a pleasure being, being uh, you know, having you on here, hearing your insights. If you want, uh, what's the best piece of content you've produced recently that I can drive readers to? I'll put it in the show notes. Well, tell them to follow me on Twitter. That's always the best content. And I share all my content on there. It's at DeAngelis Corey. Um, but I have a pretty recent um, Washington Examiner piece called why uh, government school monopolists are freaking out. And we talk a little bit about what we we're talking about today, but then also a New York piece, New York Post piece on elites go to war on homeschooling just when everyone's doing it. Awesome. I'll, I'll be sure to include those in the show notes. Corey, it's been a pleasure. Thank you again.